Hello and welcome to the Corporate Facility Council First Wednesday webinar, FM at a Crossroads, how generational shift and employee experience are changing the role of facility managers, presented by Christian Flanders, FMP. I do want to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded and everyone has been muted for audio quality. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the question box and we'll go over them during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. And also, the archive of this webinar will be stored at the CFC website, which is ifmacfc.org. And you may also access previous webinars there as well, so I encourage you to visit the website. Our presenter today is Christian Flanders, FMP. He is a workplace consultant with over 20 years of experience in commercial interior design. His recent projects include the new Golden One Center, home of the Sacramento Kings, which is the most technologically advanced and first league platinum certified arena in the country. He has been a member of the Sacramento Valley chapter of IFMA for 20 years, serving as committee chair, treasurer, vice president, and president. He currently serves as director at large mentor to the current chapter board. He is a two-time chapter associate of the year and in 2017 was named volunteer of the decade. Christian is also a member of the Silicon Valley East Bay, and San Francisco chapters of IFMA. Under his leadership, the Sacramento Valley has achieved the IFMA Awards of Excellence for Web Communication and has twice been awarded IFMA Small Chapter of the Year. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Christian. Christian, the floor is yours. Great. Fantastic. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. I'm out here on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Christian Flanders. Um, I, this is the first time I've actually done this presentation in the webinar format, so please bear with me. Uh, this presentation started out as um, a presentation on, is the open office dead? And was more to design professionals and has uh, morphed a little bit into a presentation for facilities managers. So uh, it's the first time I've done this presentation online, so bear with me. I hope you can get some uh, good takeaways from this today. We're gonna go ahead and get started. My slide is not moving. So click your PowerPoint screen and then it should start moving. There we go. Okay. So, um, you know, and I don't mean to be too preachy about this. I know you're all on the Corporate Facilities Council and have probably varying facilities in different strategic and vertical markets, different vertical markets throughout the country. But, you know, I've been involved with IFMA for 20 years and I know until recently, the profession of FM has concerned itself with the operation and maintenance of the built environment. Um, however, we're at a crossroads right now. We have a uh, uh, aging baby boomer population about to retire, and we have the millennials and now the Generation Z coming in, who have grown up in a much different environment than most of us had. And because we have such low unemployment and are trying to attract talent, the workplace is now um, becoming a strategic point of marketing, employee retract, attack, attraction, retention, and engagement, which we're gonna uh, cover in detail today. So in a rapidly changing workplace, how can the role of FM also evolve as the workplace evolves? And I think that that's been something that hasn't been touched on too much. Uh, we know the workplace is evolving, the open office, the amenities, uh, things like that, but how can the FM also involve their role to support that worker? And I think a big portion of it, just like anything else in our society, is about analytics. And in facilities, we have a lot of analytics. We have a lot of benchmarking. We talk about uh, the, the life cycle of a filter. We talk about uh, you know, cl uh, cleaning standards, cleaning benchmarking, uh, things like that. But we don't talk that much about how the user or the employee experiences their workplace because that's subjective, not objective. And that's sometimes hard for facility managers to wrap their, their heads around. But we're gonna talk about that today. So the world is changing. Um, I think we all know it. Um, urbanization, um, out here on the West Coast, uh, and then this is not just on the West Coast, but uh, we're seeing a shift of tech companies and, and other companies um, not do big, gigantic campuses out in the Silicon Valley. They're taking 50 floors and high rises in San Francisco. And that's for multiple reasons. Uh, the, the workers can't afford out to live in Silicon Valley or commute to get there into there. 
the workers that they that they hire need to live in urban areas where they can still afford it and take public transportation to work. Um, I'm going to skip over the drive for sustainability. I think we all know that that's a big issue. Leeds been around for you know a decade, two decades plus now. Uh, economic pressures we're going to go into in detail. Uh, the need for well-being as part of the user experience. Um, and technology, how that's influencing the user experience. And then of course, the changing demographics of our, of our society. So um, I wanna talk real quick about the uh, war for talent. Um, we have record low unemployment in this country right now. I checked this morning as of February, it was 4.1%. I think it'll probably dip below that. Um, Barron's quoted the US is uh, facing a labor crunch including a shortage of at least 8.2 million workers across the U.S. over the next 10 years. Uh, the labor shortage is so acute in some regions of the country that even the unemployed person, if every unemployed person across the Midwest filled a job opening, this 12-state region would still have 180,000 unfilled positions. Um, I got a notice on LinkedIn today. It was an article about how cities in the Midwest are actually paying people to move there, college-educated people. They're um, giving $5,000 uh, bonuses to pay off student loans um, and, and other bonuses to attract people into these towns. It's almost like a, like a modern homesteading act. And uh, you know the American economy is tied to this. We're highly dependent on the quality and quantity of workers. And we are facing a severe skilled and unskilled work shortage that has long-term economic implications. So this is not a generations in the workplace uh, presentation, but we're going to cover it very quickly. Um, if any of you have gone to World, World Workplace or uh, Fusion, I know that that's been a very hot topic over the last few years. Um, we currently probably have four. I don't know if there's many traditionalists still in the workforce, but let's just say we have five generations working side by side. We know that some people are staying on longer and not retiring. So I'm gonna define these terms really quickly and then we'll move on. Uh, traditionalist was born between 1900 and 1945. Uh, they were defined by World War II, the Great Depression. They were workplace loyalty. They were the per people that worked at the same company for 50 years, came back from World War II, moved to the burbs and had the baby boomers, right? Baby boomers were born from 1946 to 64. Uh, Vietnam, civil rights, hardworking, long, long hours. This is what my parents were. Next is me, the Gen Xers, the latchkey kids, right? Fall of the Berlin Wall, first Gulf War. They're independent, free agents. Got some technology with mobile phones and, and the internet, um, defined by MTV AIDS. Then we have a big generation, the millennials, in which I saw a figure yesterday that by 2021, three short years from now, Millennials will make up 50% of the US workforce. They were defined by the 9 11 attacks. Um, they're confident, uh, social everything Google, Facebook, Instagram, all the other ones I don't do. Um, one thing about them, though, that we're going to discuss is a difference between the Gen Xers or the Gen 2020. There's different names. The millennials were early adapters of technology, but they were not digital natives. Whereas Gen Z, sorry, Gen Z, Gen Z were digital natives. They had it in their cribs. They've only known a world that was completely integrated with technology, which is a very important part in workplace design. So real quick slide on the composition of the generations. As you can see here, Gen Z is the largest generation. And this is not generations in the workplace, by the way, this is just generations in general. Um, as the baby boomers move into retirement, um, Gen Z, who are now about the oldest Gen Zs, are about 20 years old right now. They'll be entering the workforce in the next few years, although we're going to talk about an interesting phenomenon that both Gen Z and millennials share. Um, but they're going to be a big part of the workforce coming up, and we need to account for that. We all know that people are the chief cost uh, um, in, in a business, right? It's about 80% of the cost. It's five, time, five to 10 times the cost of the facility. So how can we adapt our facilities to attract and retain and engage these people that are such a big cost and have such small amount of unemployment that we really are gonna be fighting for these folks coming up. 
So we're not going to go over any of the gen other generations because I think that's been kind of beaten to death in, in a lot of other presentations. We're going to talk about um, the children of Gen Xers. I'm a Gen Xer. We're going to talk about the Gen Z generation. And I got this slide from uh, K Sargent from HOK, which it just has some fantastic um, stats on it. So born between 1995 and 2009. A couple things I want to point out to you. Upper left corner, mobility, right? I worked at my previous company for 14 years, my previous company before that for seven years, and my previous company before that for seven years. Gen Z will have 17 different jobs at a minimum in their lifetime. They are also going to be the most educated generation. One in two will have college degrees. This is the one that I think people really, really enjoy is the redefined life stages. Okay. So in the 20th century, we had childhood, teenagers, adulthood, right? Today we have childhood, we have tweens, we have teenagers, we have young adult, we have kippers, adulthood, career changer, and downager. And these are, these are things that actually uh, uh, sociologists have come up with because this is, a, this is a real deal. Some of you may have, still have children that have lived at home into their 20s and 30s. Uh, this is a nationwide phenomenon. Um, when we talk about, let's go over a couple of these facts and we'll talk more about those generations. So of, of health, which is a big one, percentage-wise, 77.9% of Gen Z males will be considered obese. 61.8% of females will be considered obese. You don't think that that's going to have to be addressed um, in the workplace? It definitely will be. Another thing is about the, their digital use. Okay, The average Gen Z will use technology 10 hours and 19 minutes a day. Okay. That's a long time, and a lot of that happens at work. So let's go into the next slide here. So Kipper, right, is Peter Pan syndrome. The generations have had an eight-year delay. That teenager who maybe left uh, and went away to college when they were 18, maybe 20, is now going away to college but maybe staying at home and having an eight-year delay, which is referred to as the Peter Pan syndrome. And then the kippers are kids in parents' pockets eroding retirement savings. And this is a, is a, real, a real thing in our society um, that needs to be addressed into the workplace as these folks finally enter the workplace or are living at home and enter the workplace. Bottom right is something else I want to point out also. Um, countries with the largest number of Generation Z Number one, India. Number two, China. Number three, the U.S. So workplace traits. What does this mean to us as, as facility managers? Workplace traits. They're, they're multitaskers. Um, they do not, um, like Gen X and baby boomers, they blend their professional and, per, um, and personal personas. Um, I know that I'm probably considered a different person with my friends on the weekend than maybe I am in my professional life. And I think that's probably a trait common to, to many people of, of the, the, the Gen um, X generation and the baby boomers. Um, these folks blend that. They, they don't know anything, anything else. Um, they seek openness and transparency. Um, they have grown up in Starbucks and designed restaurants. Um, they want their workplace to have a homey feeling. We'll talk about resumercial a little bit later on, which is a trend in interior design and workplace design, but that's that homey feeling. They want aspects of their home that they're spending so much time in, including into their 20s and 30s. They want that feel at work. Um, they don't like ambiguity. They seek clarity. Um, they value stability, order, and predictability. Should be pointed out that this is a little bit different than the millennials. The millennials um, liked a little bit of unpredictability. Um, they like to be wowed in the workplace and have the bright different colors and, and have the, the lots of the, the bean bags and the pool tables and these things. This is distracting to Gen Z. They want it to be clean, focused, and not challenge um, their tendency to be easily distracted. 
Another thing is they are uh, they're emotional quotient challenged. Many of you have heard of IQ. There is also EQ. And again, this is this is a blanket statement. It doesn't apply to everybody. They've spent a lot of time heads down on their devices and their social media, including when they're hanging out with each other. They've communicated that communicated that way their whole lives, not just as they've gotten older. So a lot of times their interpersonal relationships with actual people can be challenged and we need to plan for that in the workplace. Um, again, struggle with interpersonal relationships and are easily distracted. So we talked about people being easily distracted. Unfortunately, this does not only apply to the millennials and the Gen Z. 70% of employees that is estimated are disengaged in the workplace. Here's a little bit of a demographic on engagement. Overall, they say 30% of US employees are in, engaged. Again, females more than males are engaged by 6%. Uh, most engaged worker are managers and ex executives. Least engaged are manufacturing workers. Uh, by generation, most engaged are the baby boomers. I think that makes sense. Least engaged right now are the millennials who will be 50% of your workplace within three years. Um, most disengaged is also boomers. So th this one was actually a, a stat that is, is a little confusing to the first one, but if they are in disengaged boomers, they are more likely to act out on unhappiness at work. Professional workers, construction workers, mining workers consistently have higher engagement. The largest companies, of which I think a lot of you may be involved, being on the Corporate Facilities Council, the largest companies have the lowest levels of engagement. And business units with the top quartile employment engagement outperform the bottom quartile in productivity by 17%, sales by 20%, and profitability by 21%. So this is this is a big deal. This is this is lots of dollars, billions and trillions of dollars. So how how can we affect this in the workplace? So we know that we're going to have a, a workforce that is shrinking because unemployment is so low. We know that a lot of that workforce is going to be disengaged. How can we adapt our workplace to influence and increase those employees' engagement? We can do that through the focus on people, performance over presence. Technology is gonna be a big part of it since a lot of these folks have grown up with technology and using it intelligently, which we have a slide coming up, a little video that I think will show you some aspects of that, of how that can be applied. Um, we can improve well-being. We talked about the obesity. Um, I didn't get into a lot of the stress levels, but um, suicide rates among millennials and Gen Z are higher than the previous generations, a lot of stress. Um, and we can talk about their work-life balance and, and choice that they're gonna have in the workplace. So facilities managers that I've dealt with over my 20 year career, um, a lot of them, um, they want analytics, right? They wanna know how long a filter on a uh, HVAC unit lasts. They want benchmarking on how often a space should be cleaned. Uh, they want to know how many station, how many people per per floor plate they can fit into their workplace. Um, they want they want solid stats. They're pretty focused analytical people. So how can we get those stats and that information about the experience that people have in the workplace? How can you apply a statistic into something that's subjective? So we're going to talk about that. So. User experience is becoming a big thing in workplace strategy. It's often referred to as UX. Um, here's a quote by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. And this is nothing new, right? A lot of us do this in our personal lives every day. Um, many of you probably take Uber. You rate the driver after each, after each ride. Um, and it's subjective, right? It's what your perception was of that ride and that driver. Many of you give Yelp reviews to a restaurant, TripAdvisor, um, on this slide for a movie that says that it was at Comms and Telluride and Torino film festivals. 
Um, I'm going to ask this question out loud, although I don't, I know that you can't answer. Does anyone know what this one is right here? Swipe right or swipe left? You know, these are these dating sites that many people may, meet people on now where you rate people by swiping right if you like them or left if you don't like them, and it's completely subjective. When people sell cars and other goods, they talk about all their, their awards they have, JD power and customer satisfaction, right? That's a subjective experience that that person is having about that good or service. So why can't that work in the workplace? What experience are you delivering to your employees in the workplace subjectively? So that experience is all aspects of the end user's perceptions as they interact with a workplace solution or service. It involves users, it's completely subjective, and it's about perceptions. So these are user experiences, right? I love the energy of the work cafe for impromptu meetings. Another one might be the meeting, and I know a lot of us have this happen. I still have it happen all the time. The meeting AV will still not work after I've sent in multiple tickets, right? Frustrating. The user experience approach leverages data proactively and understands user needs to create an exceptional experience. So good experiences at work are becoming a point of differentiation. They play a role in attracting, retaining, and engaging talent. So we do this in a lot of ways, and I'm gonna go into more detail in a few here. So I wanna ask you a question here. Are these user experience metrics, right? Uh, seat ratio, cost per square foot, density, occupancy rate, service ticket resolution, illumination, background noise? No, they are not. These are workplace metrics, okay? These are workplace metrics. These are not how people perceive their workplace, although though they can have um, influence on how people perceive their workplace. So what makes you, met, um, UX metrics different from other metrics? They reveal something about that person's personal experience of the space or the service they're using. We talked about that a little bit. So how do we apply these to the workplace? Um, later on, we're gonna talk about a whole new um, community of IFMA called Workplace Evolutionaries that IFMA started about five years ago to address this exact issue. And I can do a whole nother presentation on how to take user metrics and what those user metrics are. There are actually set ones in the industry that you can use in surveys, post-occupancy surveys, pre-occupancy surveys, employee surveys, and use that information um, and, and put it into categories to influence your facility design and your facility services. So basically the user metrics um, applied to the workplace break down into three categories, usability, desirability, and utility. Um, and there are uh, is a whole nother presentation on that that we can do at a later date, or if you attend any of the workplace evolutionaries webinars, um, can go into in more detail. But you collect the data, and then you apply the data, and it helps you make decisions in workplace design. Where can that where can that data and where can that information that you get from your your surveys and the data you collect where can it be used? Right at different points along the design cycle or the operation cycle. It could be early in the process as you're designing a new facility to inform your strategy and design. It could be part of workplace change in an existing facility. It could also be about evaluating employees' performance. If you're having poor performance in a certain work unit, um, maybe you should look at their user experience because that could be um, a factor in why their performance is poor or their performance is exceptional. And then again, as you're improving solutions and services, you know, the amenities that you offer in your facility, you want to get hard data before you're making that decision and spending that money. So these are just some, uh, some examples recently of, of give your employees a, vo a voice for changes you need to make to your office from now incorporated. Uh, make employees part of make employee experience part of business strategy. Call your 
We're no longer designing spaces for people who work eight to five, work is 24 seven. I could go on and on and on about these things. Um, this is the core business issue right now. So hopefully this video is gonna play. Um, this is a fantastic video on how technology, many of you may have seen this before, um, I believe it was given at World Workplace as part of either the closing or opening um, uh, ceremonies when ISS was the all event sponsor. But I think it gives you some great ideas of how technology can influence user experience. And I'm just going to let it play. Well, I, I, I just love that video. I can't get enough of it. Uh, I saw it at World Workplace and it really gave me a feeling for 
how technology can influence and improve user experience in the workplace. Now, all of us can't afford that type of technology in our facilities, but I think it shows you where things are heading um, and how it is a focus on the people that is uh, the, the, and they're how they experience the building is, is the big part of it. So some other big trends right now are, are, are other issues in business that I think are a direct result of a enhancing user experience. Um, the well building standard. I take the uh, well AP test in a couple weeks here. Um, you know, I've been involved in lead all my career where I think lead was about energy savings. Um, I think the well building standard is more about the people and how they experience um, the building and the different aspects, whether it be, um, you know, the air, the light, the water in the building, um, how that affects their actual um, uh, different uh, systems in their body and how different parts of design in the workplace can positively or negatively affect human beings and their wellness. So if you haven't checked out well, I really think it's in line with this um, new trend in facilities of focusing on user experience. Um, it's, it's definitely worthwhile looking into. I'm really excited about it. And I do think that IFMA does some partnering with um, the Well Building Institute. So we talked a little bit about earlier, I may have mentioned the term resumercial, right? So resumercial is residential and commercial. Um, you know, we've, I think we're all seeing in all of our facilities, whether it's upgraded break rooms, whether it's, um, you know, they call them wellness rooms or uh, uh, breastfeeding rooms or a place where people can go uh, have a quiet room and, and, and get away from maybe an open floor plan. We are seeing a huge influence of residential design or hospitality design into workplaces. Um, and I work in, in commercial interior design, and I can tell you there's almost no project I work on, big or small, that doesn't have some aspect of this now. Putting some stack chairs on a round table in a break room really doesn't cut it anymore. So companies large and small are integrating residential design into their workplaces. And I've just got a couple of slides here illustrating some, some of that but I think that's directly on, on user experience. There's some workstations in the background with kind of a cafe next to that where people can go have some small meetings. This one I've really seen come up in the last couple of years, really the last two years is biophilic design. Um, biophilic design can reduce stress, enhance creativity and clarity of thought, improve our well-being and expedite healing. As the world population continues to urbanize, these qualities are ever more important. So we talked about urbanization a little bit before. As we urbanize, we get less and less in touch with nature. And instead of us having to leave the building and go experience nature somewhere else, people are incorporating nature and live plants and water features and things like that into their facilities. And here are some examples of that. This is Amazon. Um, these are the spe spheres. Some of you may have seen these before, almost like greenhouses where, where employees and customers can go and, and meet and experience, even during bad cold weather, some, some, um, some nature, which is very exciting. And then this is the new Apple campus. And I um, was lucky enough to be able to work on this project. And um, this is the, the spaceship, as they call it. And this is, although this is outside the building, they do incorporate biophilic design interior, but they've integrated a large portion of nature right into their building that all the, the interior windows, which is all floors, face and, and view um, from their workplace. Amenities. A lot of you at the corporate level, um, with campuses and large facilities, amenities have been around for a long time coffee shops, um, on-site food service. Um, I think this is, this is becoming a, uh, a differentiator and is becoming more of the norm than the ex exception, uh, exception. And I think amenities will continue to draw and attract and retain and engage um, talent, especially these new generations who have grown up with these type of amenities their whole life. 
on site wellness yoga. There's the famous Google bikes, right? They've got all these different buildings. You can take the bikes from building to building. I know they also have the Google buses that can um, help you commute and go from building to building. Something that's, that's pretty new that I wanted to talk a little bit about that touches on the community is the corporate branding, right? So um, this is Bumble, which is a dating site, and this is their, their new facility. If any of you have not subscribed to on LinkedIn or have not visited the website called Office Snapshots, I highly encourage you to do. It is offices from all over the world and photos of offices all over the world that can give you some great uh, thought starters as you're planning facilities and kind of seeing what other people, and it includes different industries, um, uh, what, other, what other peers in your industry or how are they designing their facilities. But corporate branding. So you want to feel as part of a community. Um, we are in social media communities. Uh, we all are me members of all these different communities. Why not have a feeling that you're part of your work community and it's not just part of your job? We talked about how the uh, Gen Z's blend their personal and their business personas. So why not um, leverage that and make their experience at work part of the corporate branding? So this is Bumble. This is a company called Woodco. I hope you can see all the wood, different wood grains in here. And I, I didn't include too many other examples, but there are literally hundreds of how companies are using their corporate interiors for branding. And these are, these are back office facilities. These are not retail facilities. These are what the employees see, not what the customers see. So we talked a little bit about employee experience and what the worker coming into the workplace is gonna be like. Let's talk a little bit about what facility managers are today. I actually cut and pasted this from IFMA International yesterday. Um, I don't know how, how new it is, but I figure it's probably pretty up to date. Uh, the facility, average facility manager of today is male and 49 years old, college educated with a degree in business engineering or facility management, 28 years of total work experience with 16 years in facility management. Um, I think we've all felt this one, has seen his, his or her responsibilities increase over the past two years. Works in middle management, responsible for managing supervisors with a staff of one to five employees on average. Some of you folks at the corporate level are probably a little bigger than that. Um, is personally responsible for the entire facility space, managing multiple functions, including operations, maintenance, and energy management. Manages more than 1 million square feet, predominantly office space. So I think this is really shows you that it leaves out, especially in the functions that the person um, is responsible for, the operations, maintenance, and energy management, that right now the facility manager of today is not necessarily in charge of that employee experience. And I know that facility managers that I've met over my career come up in a lot of different ways in the industry. Some come up on the real estate side, some have come up on the mechanical side, some come up on the HR side, and each facility manager, depending on the company, is focused maybe in a little bit different way. And I think at least part of that focus needs to start including the experience, the user experience of the employees in the workplace. Um, maybe HR is going to take over that function. Maybe it's going to be a joint function between HR and, and facilities. But the facilities are a big part of the employee experience. So I don't think the facility manager cannot, at least in some part, be responsible for that employee experience. So community managers. So we talked about the changing role in the title of this program of facility managers. Um, about five years ago, maybe four years ago, I went to Facility Fusion in Orlando. And I went to this new learning track called Workplace Evolutionaries that IFMA was providing. And they were talking about this thing called a community manager. And I, I'd never heard of it before. And community managers started out in co-working spaces, spaces like WeWork, which is an international one. And as you had all these different workers from different companies or different businesses or different entrepreneurs, in a space that was a space they were using in the co-working space they had a community manager 
um, be responsible for the, the happiness or the, the services to those people. Shows them where the conference room were, show them how to order food, show them how to order coffee, show them how to request certain AV services. This is spilled over into the um, corporate world. And um, I'm not gonna pull it up, but if you go on LinkedIn and you type in community manager, um, you'll see positions open um, for this particular job. A lot of them also have facilities responsibilities. They're responsible for the operation and maintenance of the building, and at the same time responsible for the um, uh, experience and the engagement of the employees. Um, they're not always called community managers, and it's also a little confusing because there's another title called community manager of people who manage online communities. So you'll have to kind of skip through those, but you'll, you know, Apple has some posted, Facebook has some posted, WeWork, um, some other companies are starting to have these community manager positions that a lot of the duties sound a lot like facility manager. I've also heard it called many, many other titles, director of workplace, chief wellness officer, concierge, but it's definitely something that's penetrating the industry of facilities. What does the community manager do? They own the employee experience. Um, he, she is the host with the most. She embodies the values of the community. He, she's comfortable wearing many hats. She's an extrovert. He, she empowers the people around him. So of the facility managers that I've known over my career, some of these things definitely do not sound like the facility managers I've known, right? The extrovert part, a lot of the facility manager folks I've known are kind of behind the scenes, more introverted, but he, she is comfortable wearing many hats. I think that that is a huge overlap with facilities and why we're starting to see some folks from the facilities world become more of community managers or work closely with the community manager. I'm not gonna read both of these in, in detail, but uh, I'm gonna read the second one to you. As a great host would do at a party, the community manager makes connections among members. They remember details like who is looking for a designer and whose kids go to the same schools. They draw these members together. Some interactions will be serendipitous collisions, but the community manager's job is to help facilitate connections whenever possible, growing and strengthening the community. I think that's the social and user experience part of what these folks do. And again, if you look at their job bios on LinkedIn, you'll see that a lot of it also is the uh, maintenance and operations of the facility. So let's talk a little bit about workplace evolutionaries. Um, I hope you all either, when you get my presentation or write this down right now, please go visit um, we.ifma.org. That's workplace evolutionaries. Um, there is a huge, robust community on there of facilities managers and workplace strategists who um, are part of this user experience and who are concentrating on that part of the work. So if you're a facility manager who thinks this might become something that you need to be concerned with but don't have any experience in it, this is the, the group for you. It's $55 on top of your IFMA membership. Um, and you get all the benefits, the webinars. Um, again, they have their own learning track at World Workplace and Facility Fusion. And um, this is going to be something that's growing more and more and more within the FM world is this workplace evolutionaries. And I think it's fantastic that IFMA has recognized this. Um, in addition to the councils, we have a group because I know that most facility managers don't come up on the workplace design and kind of that HR side, IFMA is addressing this by providing a resource to you all um, that didn't come up on that side of the business. They can go and get um, some education and start incorporating this into your uh, scope of work. So that's all I have for today. Um, I kind of jumped around a little bit. Um, I will answer any questions and we'll send this presentation out. I wanted to touch on those three kind of major key things. The generations coming in with the labor shortage, the user experience, which is so important to those folks, and how as facility managers, we can adapt our role to address the needs um, of those folks coming into the workplace. And thank you very much. Great, thank you, Christian. If anyone does have any questions, please feel free to type them into the question box 
on your control panel. I'll be happy to present them to Mr. Christian. Um, one question is, can you talk about the tension between older senior leadership and the new push for the UX? Is there a resistance from senior leadership? Um, from senior leadership, um, I can only speak for, you know, what I deal with out in the, on the West Coast with a lot of the larger tech companies and financial services companies. I think they get it. Um, I think it probably differs from region to region and probably within the industry you're in. I don't think it's the norm yet. I think that there's probably some insurance companies in the Midwest or Northeast or, you know, that, that don't, aren't, aren't to that point yet that say, hey, you know, we hire people to do a job. This is the work we're going to give them a safe um, workplace, um, but you know their user experience isn't a concern to us yet. I can tell you that they will be behind the eight ball because of these generations coming in. Their whole life with their helicopter parents and staying at home longer, and everybody getting a trophy, and the life that they've led, the user experience is their prime factor, and because their emotional you know, their emotional IQ is lower, they aren't necessarily able to fit into those old style workplaces where everything is, you know, standards and things like that. You've got to be willing to evolve. Um, I think that IFMA is recognizing it um, at the higher level. And I think that, uh, you know, I go to these IFMA seminars, I go to World, World Workplace and I go to all the classes and I hear the grumbling as we talk about some of these things. You know, there's facility managers in there who, who make the little comments under the breath, but I think you're going to get that with any type of, of, of change in the workplace. And I think that you just need to um, listen to what the industry and the data is telling us. Uh, it doesn't lie. And, and to move forward with these ideas. Great. And so what are some of the questions or ideas for the facilities department? partner with HR and to identify, or excuse me, let me start over. What are some questions or ideas for the facilities department to partner with HR to identify opportunities to influence design and user experience? Yeah, I, you know, um, I will, before I email this back to you, Joshua, there's a slide I had in the, my more design version of this, um, of this presentation that I'll put back in there before I send over to you that talks about some of the questions and some of the actual um, measurements that you can do. But I think a lot of it, um, uh, if you're a member of Workplace Evolutionaries, the great thing is um, you, can, you can get some of the templates and some of these questions um, and some of these surveys um, given to you um, from some of the other members and as a resource what they have in the, in the library. Um, but I think a lot of it might just be as simple as, as, as surveying um, you know, how do you feel about your workplace? Um, and it could be a numerical rating system, right? Now, each person's perception, they're gonna rate it differently depending on the generation they are. But I think you also need to, for the first time, allow them to write in some information. Um, different people are, some people are gonna say they want more privacy. Some people are gonna say they want more, um, you know, more of an open office. Um, I think you need to get as much data as possible and also understand who that data is coming from generation wise, and then make design decisions within the workplace. Um, I know that one of the biggest issues that we are, I have faced over the last few years is as we have the baby boomers, the millennials in the workplace at the same time, and they're about, and Gen X about 50-50, is the open office, right? Um, you make it too open, people are distracted by noise and distractions, um, but you want to uh, um, have that collaborative open feel to the office that's not all, you know, six feet tall, six by eight workstations. I think the thing is now is you, it can't be one or the other. You've got to have a blending of applications within your office. If you go to that office snapshots website, you will see that there are conference rooms that are private with the standard conference room table in there. There are conference rooms that have um, stuffed chairs in there. There are coffee shops that have booths. There are, um, there are um, uh, workstations that are more open, that are workstations that are more closed, depending on the job function. I think 
against what normal facility managers usually think where standards apply to the whole office, I think you need to differentiate more depending on the type of work done and be willing to do that, which I think is counterintuitive to a lot of facility managers, is one standard cannot apply across the whole workplace that does multiple different job functions and has multiple different age groups doing certain job functions. You've got to be willing to change and got to be willing to um, um, diversify your standards, I'll call it. But questions wise, um, if you become a member of Workplace Evolutionaries, or even if you don't become a member, um, there are resources in there as an IFMA member that you can do to get questionnaires, um, detailed questionnaires with rating systems that um, are design-oriented questions and user experience-oriented questions that you can get as a facility manager to incorporate into your workplace surveys. Okay. There we go. And then also you might be able to um, search in the knowledge library as if my members you have access to the knowledge library. And you can also search that topic and you might come up with articles as well that could help yeah. guide you. And I don't, unfortunately, I don't know how, if the we, the we resources, workplace evolutionaries is uh, like, you know, kind of kept in a separate place if it's only in the we group or if it's also incorporated into the, the general IFMA resources. That part I, I, I don't know, but I'm sure someone at IFMA could help you with that. Yeah, I think some of them have been integrated, but, um, also beyond what we put out, anything, if it has been put into the knowledge library, it's like the keeper of that kind of stuff as well. So it's an additional resource on top of going to the we um, web page, which I encourage you to go to as well. I just think that a, a real key of this is you're not just going to be able to download some questions and understand this. I think the, the resources that like a group like we can provide um, and the furthering of education about user experience and how that can be incorporated into workplace operations and design is something that's, that's very evolving right now. It needs to be kept up with as a facility manager, and that's what we use for. Okay, great. Um, let's see, uh, here's one more. So have you ever personally seen or heard of a major fail where the intended design or user experience wasn't adopted after it was installed? Absolutely, and I have a great example of that. I have lots of them, but this is one I, I, I always use. Um, so we did a, a pre-occupancy study, a pro, we, we kind of call kind of programming, uh, did surveys of different departments within the company, and um, it was a real estate company. And uh, you know they wanted the, the more open floor plan, they wanted, um, uh, they wanted the, the informal meeting rooms um, in addition to formal meeting rooms. And um, we did some mock-ups, of course, which I think are a big part of this process is, you know, making employees empowered. You know, if they're going to go from one workplace to another workplace, that's a drastic change is you can order things like workstation mock-ups and, and see how people react to them. Sometimes what people say they want and what their reaction is once they get it are, are two different things, and you need to understand that. But we did this. We did this. Uh, um, we did this. We did a floor for them first, the first floor, um, and then we were going to do it by floor. And we did this beautiful um, next to workstations. Uh, we did this uh, touchdown space. They're called lots of different things: touchdown spaces, informal meeting areas, um, and it was uh, you know some stuffed chairs, some couches. Um, some kind of like TV tray type things where they could put a laptop, um, coffee tables. Um, everything was kind of mobile so they could move them around depending on the size of the group or the department. Was in. And we did these throughout the, the floor plate. And we, the biggest one was not being used. Um, we went back after the floor was installed to do a post occupancy study and it wasn't being used. And we could not understand why. The other ones throughout the space were being used. And um, so the other ones were being used somewhat, but not as much as we thought they'd be. But this one wasn't being used at all. And it was kind of the, the showpiece one, the biggest one. And um, so we, we, we observed and we couldn't figure out why this wasn't being used. And finally, 
um, we did a survey, we did some actually interviews, one-to-one -one interviews, and um, one of the things that came up was that this touchdown space was in front of the CEO's office. And people were afraid to go sit in that space because they were afraid that they'd think that the CEO would see them and think that they were not working. So it wasn't a design flaw, it was a culture issue. And so we went to the CEO and said, this is what's happening. You need to use this space to show people it's okay. So sometimes you think it's a design issue, um, but you really need to dig a little deeper to understand sometimes as you make these changes in user experience and workplace design, that the culture also needs to change with it. And we didn't go into that very much, but culture is a big part of user experience. But you need to um, allow people to be part of the culture change and inform them and keep them informed and have it be top down instead of bottom up, or people will be afraid to work any differently than they were before. Yeah, getting that C-suite buy-in is always the make it or break it in any of these concepts. I have I've come to find out in talking to members. Um, excellent, Christian. I think it was a great presentation. We're about up on time right now, so I think this is a good place to wrap it up. Any final words before I close it out? No, I you know, unfortunately, I didn't get to know who any of you are because I'm the one talking and, and you aren't, but uh, I appreciate it very much. I'm very involved in IFMA and I, uh, uh, I look, you know, I think Josh has my contact info if anybody thinks of any other uh, additional questions. And I look forward to seeing you all out at a World, World, World Workplace or a, a IFMA event coming up. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you for attending the first Wednesday webinar. Um, I look forward to seeing you all next month. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. <coughs>